It helps me to take away the problems of the outside world. I can internalize problems so that I hate myself and not others. It doesn't help me in the long term, but I'm in charge of so many people. I can't continually wreak my vengeance on them. Welcome back to the Daniel's Nemesis podcast, reading chapter 16, William Talks. Imaginatively titled chapters, like the one above, do not do any justice to the imagination within each chapter. This is X-Book, a novel whose name is so nondescript that it, too, gives no suggestion of the pages within the imagined covers. I say imagined covers, for each week I read out a novel that was never to be published. Thankfully, now that the internet has become little more than people spouting off poorly thought-out opinions and showing us what they had for lunch, a space has become available for my own self-indulgence. X-Book. It's a story. At one point, it was called X-Story. Aliens Invading the Earth is a tale you've all heard before. Many masters have put their own twist on that classic. But no master ever attempted to set the alien invasion right after the First World War. No master ever tried to make the whole thing surreal by blending inner visualizations with external realities. To date, no master has done any of this still. I was a naive fool. And I, Daniel's nemesis, wrote this book. I was a younger lad then. Older and more exposed to internet fan theories about superhero movies, I then deep dive analyze the chapter. Recently, my attempts have been sabotaged with other people talking over me, or just things that I need to say going missing. Those people being the old neurons in my brain firing back up, as well as one of the characters from this book. Part of me wants to call this the Two Ids and a Super Ego podcast, but that just justifies their existence when it shouldn't. So, what's happened so far? William, the supreme leader of the Trascons, travelling 850 years from their dying planet to Earth, has wondered how best to get his race onto Earth. Pressuring himself into it, he decides on an invasion. Ginger, human fighter pilot. Um, Ginger single-handedly fended off the first wave of the alien invasion. A man whose previous claim to fame in this novel was going on vacation and then not being on vacation who played childish games of I Spy with his girlfriend, likes driving in his car. That guy, yeah, he beat up a bunch of aliens in their massively superior flying around machines. I should state that this is quite a dark chapter with self-harm being portrayed. Yes, that's a spoiler, but a necessary one. Just remember, this is fiction. Always fiction. Logic is as logic does. But that old caveat doesn't do justice to the realities that many live through. Chapter 16. William Talks. War? Do you think I don't know anything about war? Do you honestly feel that nearly a millennia in space and we have grown naive about war? We know about war. We know about squabbles. We know about invasions. We know about defense. We know that the best way to avoid war 
is to not have it, to talk, but people won't listen. We know about war. We have had many wars over the century alone. We have had about 10 collisions of opinion. It is nasty. You get a whole world in which to have wars. We have confined spaces, corridors, rooms. If a bomb is hidden in the room, anyone inside dies when it goes off. People in the next room die or get badly injured. I'm sure you can guess the rest. Gas in ventilation systems targeted at specific rooms. I have my own oxygen tank in my room. I have to supervise its refilling for my own private supply every day. That too is continually checked and monitored and guarded. And the guards are guarded. It's terrible. The main supplies are under extreme supervision. The whole ship could die if that was poisoned. But now the poison gas comes like a bomb, positioned in ventilation shafts. A bomb's position is crucial, and its effect is only in the immediate area. But they too are ruthless. What if you block the exits? Then, when you run into a room with a dangerous weapon, people have nowhere to run to, and that is the end of them. But you ask, why is there such a war? When your considered greatest enemy is humankind, why destroy your own? Factions grew on board almost immediately. After a generation or so, the people growing up who had not faced the massive propaganda campaigns to get people off the planet, a group started forming that wanted to go back home. They were not to realize the dangers of staying, that within only a few generations, life on Trasconia would simply become unbearable. Conditions were already worsening by the time we left. The temperature causing seas and polar caps to evaporate, building up the cloud cover and blocking in heat. Suffocating pressure that will soon crush anyone who stands on that planet. Already we had moved underground creating a life only of walls and ceilings. But that precious oxygen will only be poisoned by other gases created in such heat. And we could never push away our star, its wind corroding our ozone and bathing us in its sweet solar wind of radiation. We lived our life then, as we do now, confined. But at least Trascon was our very own. Unease was settling in. Knowing that they could get back to Trasconia within a matter of decades, they wanted to go back, to see the world that they came from. Knowing that Trasconia was a relatively short distance away, they wanted to repair the damage we had caused to our ecology. Granted, we did not always care greatly for it, but compared to the sun, the ecology paled in significance. I hate to say that, but it's true. Earth citizens will find that too, no doubt, in a few millennia. You see... You love your stories of life on Mars, yet your scientists look to Venus with an atmosphere much like your own to find life. 
Never has Venus had life, but it's a reflection of what Trascon is almost and what Earth will be in a fraction of our sun's life. And when, no doubt, we shall have to move on again. Culture had not yet adjusted to life in space, and quite frankly, it wasn't going to. We still had many films and pictures from Trasconia. At that time, it broke the hearts of the older generations who had left Trasconia, and it amazed, astounded, and created such strong feelings of an imagined home, a sentimental home amongst the people who had never been there. They could only ever see these landscapes on film, of this limited view within a picture, and they wanted to see the world for themselves. I know that feeling so well. I hate to see life packaged like this when I could be outside. But then I had a different expectation. I was of a generation that knew it was going to get off at the next stop. Culture was not ready to let go. Many religious practices were still performed, and among the religious wing, sparks really began to fly. Although there have been many, many religions, those with similar beliefs, even after vicious years of war, started to slowly merge together to create super-religions. These had larger numbers of followers and were therefore able to gain greater political power. But back in space, these religious authorities, who were all too happy to come along for the ride, turned around and started preaching about how we were turning our backs on our gods. By now, this is a few generations on. By leaving our planet, we are rejecting it. We are rejecting our gods too, for they created that planet for us, and it is not up to us to decide whether or not we should leave. For them, if the gods choose to destroy us, then they should destroy us. If we can prove ourselves worthy enough, then we shall be saved. It is actually quite interesting, this debate, as you can see the way that religion evolves to save itself, to pull itself out of trouble. It was only when it became realized that the sun was going to have the destructive power that it has that the sun became a major focus of attention. For some religions, the sun became the heaven, that when you die, that's where the soul goes, to this magical place that has all this power, that helped to create and spawn life on Trasconia, and that is where life will return when it dies. Another belief is that the sun is a god, and that this god is returning to the Trascon world to rule first and then to judge. Factions grew between the two groups, the religious that wanted to leave and return, and the runners that wanted to carry on, to find this new world that we can claim. But this does not alleviate my worry. I should not be concerned with the past, but the present. I'm pacing backwards and forwards, not paying much attention to what anyone else is saying, which is probably for the best, as no one can say anything of real importance right now. 
Our fightest moves should have spoken to us by now or done something by now, but they have not. We have had no word from them for the last half hour or so. Nobody knows where they are. People have offered suggestions, reassurances, that because we are not used to transmitting radio messages in an environment as dense as the Earth's, that the radios have packed in. This does not console me. Neither does the fact that, regardless of communication, they have not returned. Where are they? What are they doing? I speak out loud to no one in particular, but I want answers now. I point at someone nearby. It is an entirely random point, but it happens to fall on my second in command. The boy panics and just says the first thing that comes to mind. They must have been delayed, Supreme Master of Everythingness. I really have to cringe. Delayed? The cringe turns into a scream. Doing what? Their orders were simple. They were to go down and find out the answer to whether or not the humans would surrender. Make them if they had to. I try to calm myself down. Of course they won't. But that's humans for you. The fuck squirms. I can see it on his face. If he had a gun, he would shoot himself right there and then. He can see it on my face. If I had a gun, I would do it for him. Maybe, says another voice. It comes from Skurnage, cutting off when he realizes I am looking at him. I don't know, sire. He finishes. They kept in contact on the way. They got in contact to tell us that they'd arrived. They should have got back in touch by now, telling us how the humans have reacted. They should have told us they were on their way back by now. I say this calmly, but I can feel my eyes popping out of my shaking head as I restrain myself. The second in command, the security chief, Yurtjuk, or whoever he is, decides he had better say something to try and get rid of the embarrassment of earlier. Maybe they're just unavailable. Unavailable! How can they be unavailable? They're in the front row seats for crying out loud! This is like a badly written play by a comic that has no comic talent. Someone is having a laugh at my expense. I excuse myself. I try to leave through the doors, but they don't open for me. It's always the small things. And I snap. From my standing position, I quite literally jump at the door, hurling myself with force, smacking my head into it. I kick and punch the door, punch myself, headbutt the door again, harder. Someone restrains me. I'm about to turn on them before realizing that they are there to help and that I've gone over the top. The doors are opened. I go into the toilet. I stand there, facing the mirror. I remember what it was like. When I was doing my training, you'd be asked questions. You'd be prepared. You'd have done the reading. You'd have made notes. But the question would put you off. You wanted to answer, so you'd open your mouth and out would come the weakest, half-garbled, as you realized what you were saying, answer. And you would want to kick yourself afterwards. I almost broke out into tears a couple of times after my mind frustrated me. 
My mind takes a bit of time sometimes, but I know I'll get there in the end. I guess, no. I know it's just the same for them. They are as stressed as me. They don't know the answers because nobody knows the answers. I need to calm myself down, think through this properly before I act. I'll get there in the end. I take off my top. I look at my arm. It is scarred. I reach into my pocket. I have a knife there. My fingers clench it as I bring it out. It is a portable knife, therefore I can fold it away. It is just a plain knife. It has none of our traditional barbs on it. Just a practical, portable knife, which is currently resting on the surface of my arm. I place it in a slightly better position. Then I just look at it. My heart seems to get heavier as I wonder why I need to do this. I think I am slightly afraid. I will not hurt myself. I won't really harm myself. It is more of an empty gesture. A gesture to say that I cannot satisfactorily go through the day without doing something wrong. Yet a part of me still, just a tiny part, thinks that I am afraid. In order to satisfy that negative feeling, I apply pressure to the knife and pull quickly back. Calculated and lacking feeling, this gesture is not enough. Watching the tiny trickle of blood, I rip again and again and again and again. This time, letting it out. I hate myself. You are a cunt. Fucking die, you fucking feet. Twat. Die. Die. And as I watch the skin open and the holes fill with blood before spilling down my arm, adrenaline pumping through my body, anger spreading slowly through my body, bringing it satisfaction, satisfaction to see my own blood. But it is more than that. It is redemption, revenge against myself for being a cunt. It deserves to be there, has to be there. My arm is brown, covered in its own blood as streams join, forming rivers, eventually rolling off my elbow onto the floor below. And I lick the blood, tasting how metallic it is. I put my mouth over one of my cuts, and I suck. I suck the blood into my mouth. In the mirror, I can see my stained teeth as I bring my mouth away, my arm growing awful prickling sensations where the blood has been sucked out. Now it hurts. Now I feel pain. Now I feel I am. It helps me to take away the problems of the outside world. I can internalize problems so that I hate myself and not others. It doesn't help me in the long term, but I'm in charge of so many people. I can't continually wreak my vengeance on them. My problems out there still exist, obviously. It won't be until we know what has happened that they'll go away or intensify. But for now, if I can stop getting angry at everyone else, stop putting pressure on everyone else and leave that for me, then at least we might be able to make some headway. I wonder whether or not to be sick. I stand in front of a basin, not sure. I feel a little weak and nauseous, so I decide to rid myself of those feelings. I feel much better. I feel ready to go back out after mopping up my arm.
my absence has been of some use. The radio control operator has decided to step in. Rather than wait for my orders, he has been re-attempting to get in contact with the missing Smooths. I enter on his fifth attempt. Smooths, one, two, and three. This is Mothership. Please report. The radio operator waits for an answer, but nothing comes. I wonder if he actually knows what he's doing. I don't think I know anymore. He tries again. Ships, one, two, and three, please come in. He gives up and looks to me. He looks as tired as I do. They are not answering, oh, amazingly wonderful one. I nod. He looks down. That was his moment of potential glory gone. Sorry, Lord, murmurs the radio operator. Well, what can have happened to them then? I ask. Second in command, Security Chief Yurtjuk has another good idea. Maybe they were attacked. I burst into laughter. This is actually a great fear of mine right now. I guess the laughter is to disguise that, but I go along with the pretense anyway. Almost certainly, I believed. I honestly believed that the bullets the humans would have fired would have had no effect due to the shields our smooths are equipped with. These shields are just as necessary for entry into an atmosphere as for defensive purposes. But though they got to Earth safely, I just hope that the shields weren't affected in any way. In my absence, Skirnach has also been useful. Returning to his monitors, he has been examining his charts in detail. Hang on, sire. He fiddles round with a few of his controls. On the big screen, a vague outline of a country appears. There are three flashing dots, static, in the lower right of the country. Look here, on the screen. The three smooths are still there. They have not disappeared. But get this. This is interesting. When we zoom in, the outline of the country slowly turns into outlines of streets. We notice that there are two smooths there in London, where we sent them. Whereas 10 miles away, we quite clearly have the third smooth moving away. But it's moving linear across land rather than vertically. It is not coming back. Now, when we first saw those three dots, they looked static. That is because we had zoomed so far out that for the dots to make a movement, they have to make a significant movement where they are, tens, if not a hundred miles at a time. But here, where we are closer, and the ratio is much smaller. We would expect to see those dots moving, as the movements made by the smooths could be greatly decreased in order to make a significant difference to our screens. Those two dots are not moving because the smooths are not moving. Whereas 11 miles away, we can see this dot is moving because the smooth is moving. Where? We don't know. But the puzzle of what's going on becomes much greater. They are not dead. They are certainly not all dead. But they have not made contact, and we are not getting through. Shut up! But that's impossible. Unless they were defeated, sir, says the cunt Yurtjuk with a hint of smugness. But how come there's still one left, hmm? I say that we send out another smooth to find out what is happening. And to make sure that we do, I will come personally. Number two, you are in charge of a ship when I leave. Skirnage, you are with me.
You heard Jack and Skernash speak together. Aye, oh, oh magnificently, magnificent, magnificent one. one. Personally, my fear is this. The ships have never flown in an atmosphere before. But they suffered damage on entry. But in their weakened state, they could be overpowered. Why send only three, though? Why only to one place? Why not more? I didn't think about it. Was I trying to be fair? General notes. I've drank lots of coffee today. I understand that this section of the podcast has been invaded quite a lot recently. I think it's due to tiredness, so let's see how caffeine affects things. Well, we get to see William in all of his glory today. It's a bit of a roller coaster for him. William is being confronted by his own choices. His own lack of decisiveness about what to do with the humans has reared its ugly head. In previous chapters, he's not been sure whether invasion is the right thing to do or not. In the last chapter, we actually saw the scale of his invasion. It wasn't Hollywood scale, was it? You're not going to get Michael Bay all excited over this. Damn, that should have been the episode title for last week. How to fail at being Michael Bay. Not enough females for him to pour the male gaze over for one thing. However, William too has entered the second act. His world has turned upside down due to consequence. In typical antagonist form, William has instigated, but now he is facing a severe consequence for his choice. In a world where hierarchy is important and William is always told he is right by yes-men, this is clearly a moment where something has gone wrong. And it's gone wrong publicly. But we are still very, very early in the second act here. I don't want to delve in any more than I have done. So let's look at another aspect of William that is becoming more and more clear. William is completely anthropomorphized. He's supposed to be an alien. He acts very, very human. In fact, he demands the other Trascons around him to act human. He talks about that in a much earlier chapter, and this at least explains some of what I want to cover today. I've talked about his relationship with exposition. I've talked about it in relation to world building. But is this all that the exposition reveals to us? Is the exposition purely a functional technique? Or can we glean something else? By creating an alien civilization, how alien have I actually made it? It's easy to make things alien when talking about technology. It's easy to make things other when putting them in a confined space like a spaceship. I can other geography and technology. That's not problematic and is more than expected in any sci-fi story in every medium. But in this chapter, I talk about war and about religion. These are very human traits. Instead of anthropomorphizing just William, arguably I've anthropomorphized the whole of the race. It turns out that just calling some of my characters alien is not enough. Rather than building up an alien world, I've made an alien race more relatable, in the process creating more of an alternate human history rather than an intriguing backstory to a race that comes from a distant planet. So why is this? I'm going to call this the Doctor Who effect, though the Star Trek effect may equally be relevant. When we think about how aliens were portrayed, 
particularly in the 60s and 70s, and on TV, what do we think? Being British, I think of actors in cardboard costumes, conveniently speaking in English to our hero that we tune in each week to watch. Civilizations are always conveniently Earth-like, because if you only have 30 to 50 minutes to establish an alien race, their problem, and a way for the Doctor or James T. Kirk to solve the problem, well, it needs to be relatable. It's not until relatively recent that aliens not just look more alien, but act more alien. Fine, we can talk about movies and literature that do that much better. Alien from 1979 establishes a very hostile monster that is very non-human, and that was the late 70s. Alien just focused on the monstrousness of the alien, however. There are hints of hierarchy that are insectoid in behavior, therefore understandable. 2016's arrival establishes the massive difference of culture through language. I'm sure that there's a great Lacanian interpretation of that movie out there that I'd love to read. As someone living overseas, I'm fascinated with the idea of how we are born into language and how language defines us and the culture around us. As effects get better and we can get away from cheap costumes, we can create more alien aliens. By focusing on an individual aspect, feeding behaviors or language, we can make aliens more non-human. One thing that is relatable to us or understandable can be flipped on its head to form the premise of that alien movie. But for me, I was going off the media I was familiar with. Remember, this was begun in the late 90s. I think I was still stuck in the idea that fictional aliens are just humans with some degree of makeup on and wearing shiny clothes or just tinfoil. I've clearly made an attempt to build the Trascon world and its history. But it's too human, isn't it? The broader a look I took at the Trascon history and culture, the more unable or unwilling I was to take various facets and subvert them. Also, remember, I was a naive country boy. Even a relatively small town was a vast, inaccessible metropolis in my eyes. Ultimately, I guess, this was just my way of digesting my understanding of human history and nature. And speaking of exposition, William's finally interested in the present. He's aware, self-aware of looking backwards so much. But in doing so, William has stepped out of his comfort zone, his happy place. As mentioned earlier, he is beginning to confront reality, and it doesn't make him a happy boy. Which brings us to the psychologist's chair. You're not ready for this. I am not a voice actor. I am, surprisingly, a trained actor. I have a degree and everything. But I am not a voice actor. Chapters like this with multiple voices put dread into me as I don't feel capable. My vocal range is not much. Talents I have learned for the stage and screen are not necessarily transferable when in audio form only. After all, you can't see my body gestures, my arms flailing around, the contortions on my face. I only hope that those physical movements come across in my vocal yes. reading. Yes, keep talking about this. But this reading is good. both William and Ginger, that's surprisingly easy for me. 
I can get inside their heads quite easily. I can be them, probably because I put so much of myself into them all those years ago. That doesn't mean I don't have to do multiple retakes. You really don't ever want to hear a raw recording. It's at least twice, if not three times as long. But I'm much happier with the results of me reading William and Ginger than I am when I do the openings or analysis to the podcast. I guess that's because I actually haven't found my own podcast voice yet. Sure, William and Ginger's voices are evolving, but that's partly me becoming more comfortable reading them, and partly because it takes the book as a whole a while to settle into itself. But I'm beating around the bush. Yes, because you're not ready to talk Today about is this. the closest I've ever had to a one-take recording. I was a self I was a Don't self long say long. it. I always wanted it to be represented in this book. In fact, this is not actually the first occurrence. There have been other references, some more oblique, some more on the nose, without actually being the act itself. This chapter shows the act. You're really not ready to talk about this. Don't say it. I feared this chapter. I've seriously been dreading this chapter as it exposes something I've always kept hidden. So keep and doing that. Reading that section of this chapter was so ridiculously easy. You're not ready for this. You're not ready for this. You're not ready. I've this chapter of I've always I've read through this chapter a few times and I've always been taken back to that time that space You a lot of into put a lot of yourself into something, then it's there waiting to embrace you when you revisit it. What I described was quite a common series of thoughts, actions, feelings. I guess I today till I finished didn't re recording realize and I guess I didn't realize until I finished recording today just how implanted that routine was in my head reading it on aim word today's past day I was a screen it hasn't just Today, I wasn't just passively reading words on a screen. I was reading out loud, and I really relived every, every moment. The way that it came out in my voice is the way that it came out, because... I wasn't in my room stood in front of a microphone. I was back there doing what I did to myself so often. Those addiction pathways that I have not visited for a long time lit back up in my mind. Stop! Stop now! Getting depressing. So, what have we got to look forward to next time? Well, 
there's lots of Flight Lieutenant Johnson, my least favourite character to do a voice for. Until next time, TTFN. And just in case you're wondering, all text was written by me, Daniel's nemesis. Our next book is purely a work of fiction and is not meant to be based on anyone or any events at all. The music was also by me, Daniel's nemesis, as was the image that accompanies this podcast. It sucks, doesn't it? But there we go.